Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Galia Warrior. So I hope you're all here to hear about deep learning and little ponies. Otherwise, you know, make sure you're in the right room. So how was your day so far? Morning, good, lunch, all great? Awesome. Right. So um, just briefly to introduce myself, I'm a cloud solution architect in, at Microsoft in the UK. So I flew across the world here to be here. So this is my little daughter, so who she's, she's four and a half years old. She just started school, so she's not here right now, but sometimes she attends conferences with me. So and the reason why we're talking about, why I'm talking about little ponies here is because my daughter, and I'm sure if you have children, you know what it is, she's obsessed with cartoons. And one of her favorite one is My Little Pony. How, uh, who have grown up, you know, knowing or watching My Little Ponies? Any of you? Yeah, some of you. Well, I, I, I had this in the UK, so a few people said, like, yeah, when I was small, I remember watching it. But I grew up in Russia, so none of that existed in, when I grew up. So my daughter is watching these cartoons now. There are 30 plus or even more characters, I kid you not. And she's talking, you know, this character, that character. I'm trying to kind of remember and follow, but it's impossible, right? So. And I'm thinking, okay, how can I you know, have meaningful conversation with my toddler? How can I actually relate to what he's going through and understand at least who are the characters? And you know, growth mindset and all that, you can do some super learning techniques to memorize it, but you know, it's too much. I have enough Azure services to remember about. You know, there's, there's too much in my day-to-day day -day life. So I work for Microsoft. I'm sure there's some services I could bring in to actually help me on this task and how to, how to deal with the classifying of the characters of the cartoon. And I'm looking at the fact that I actually don't have any data, you know, obviously TV cartoons and all that, but do I, can I actually find this data set of those ponies, of those um, images? And what I'm doing is actually, I just looked, you know, I don't want to do any screenshots or anything. I don't have access to Harsbo. I don't work with Harsbo with my customers, so I don't have access to any of the data. They can't, you know, none of that is available to me. So actually, I found uh, a wonderful repository, and there's a Python script which allows you to download, you know, images with various parameters, which you may, you know, you'll find it useful. I'll show you how you can use it later on, but you might find it useful. And uh, so what I did is I've downloaded a data set of a number of samples of ponies. There are like six or seven characters I'm kind of mainly concerned about. So what should I do now from, from that point? So looking at cognitive services, some of you may have seen the previous talks or there would be some later today as well. Uh, Microsoft and other cloud providers as well offer a lot of pre-trained services where you can actually use to do some vision task, language task, speech task, whatever it might be. So, okay, I'm looking at that, and this is what I often demo to my customers too. And there's one service, and uh, I'm just interested if any of you have seen it or have tried it, called Custom Vision. So some of you have seen it, cool. So I'm gonna show you very quickly a few minutes demo of how you can actually build very quick model using the pre-trained pre -trained models and um, how, we could, how we could actually use it. Let me just switch to my um, screen here. Right, so can you see it? Let me just maybe increase a little bit. Right, so the link is actually, so I'll show you in the slide, it's called www.customvision.ai. So what that link brings you to, so you can create a project. Um, we're gonna do a little new project and uh, the details, so we provide my Ponies, and do not, it's a bit hard to see, S and C. Uh, well, offer this, you know, project description, where we're gonna deploy it, so we're gonna deploy it to my Azure resource group. Uh, this service supports two types of projects. You can do one is classification, which what we're gonna be doing, and the second one, which is at the moment is in preview, so you can actually do object detection within the picture. And the different uh, types of classification you could do, it's multi-label when you have multiple text. So you have an image and then the service will tell you what are the, you know, what are the probabilities of particular tag being there or there's a multi-class. 
and domain is general. Something I just will mention very quickly here is there are different domains because the pre-trained models are kind of using behind the scenes the, you know, it could be food related, it could be landmark related pre-trained models, it could be just general. And there are three ones at the bottom which are compact and those are allowing you to take those models onto your uh, Android application, onto your iOS application, actually use it on, on the edge, on the mobile phone itself. So let's go create general one. And that has been annoying message. So what we get into, uh, we have a screen where we have uh, iterations, we'll see that, uh, tags, so these are our classes. So in our case, it would be five or six classes of um, ponies. And then we start training, so we start adding the images, first of all. And let's go into demo, train. So I have a number of images I've downloaded, pre-downloaded and uh, minimized. So for the service, you may, you can start with 20, 30 images actually, just to see how it works. I have 80 because we're gonna use the same data set later on, so I'll just use all of those. And um, I've had those images and I create a tag. And that character, if you didn't know, is Applejack. We upload those images. The Wi-Fi seems to be all right. So I upload them into the service. Okay, one of them failed. It's all right, we can live with that. And let's do the same for a couple of more classes. And in our case, maybe we'll take this one, Fluttershy. Right, we do the same. We might have some duplicates again. Let's see how it works. Right, three images, good stuff. And the last one, I won't do all seven of them, I'll just do three classes at the moment just to demo how it works. And another one, super pinky one. Somebody asked me before, you probably love ponies, that's why you're talking about them. I, like, I hate them. <laughs> but, you know, when you have children, you start learning and start loving things they do. <laughs> right, so we uploaded that, those images, so we have our data set to start working with. So the custom vision service allow you to take the custom images and train your model. And we do press the green button called train. And what's happening is it uses the pre-trained models, and we'll learn how to build those later, and actually applies this custom images and build the classifier using those three classes we've provided. And that would be our first iteration, so it shouldn't take long time, should be probably a few minutes. And um, so you can see, so the, the training process is basically, uh, so it, it uses those images to understand if it can use it to, you know, if, it, if it's precise enough, if it can actually uh, you can actually read it, but basically the precision is, does it, um, does your model actually likely to say it's a correct image when it's, you know, when it does testing or recall? And we're doing, we're doing pretty well here, the numbers are quite high, but this is our training model, so it's all great, so the model itself is fairly confident in things, but what we could do is also we could do a quick test. And when we do this quick test, we can use either an image URL from the on anywhere in the internet, or we can browse local files. And obviously for testing, we'll use something which model hasn't seen before. And we will use, so I have a bunch of uh, test images, and uh, which were not used as part of training, and we'll do one of those. And you can see that despite our model being in 90%, it's actually uh, mislabeled it. So it thinks it's a probability 67, I think it's a bit, hard to see at the back, but basically probability 67, it's a uh, tag Fluttershine and Applejack, which should be a correct one, is just 2.5. And that's down to the fact that we don't have enough representation, we don't have enough images of different types of images because there's a lot of pink background here, so it's probably confused a little bit. And if you look at just very quickly at another file of the same, uh, of the same character, we can see that the probability of that being an Applejack is actually 19.6 is the highest probability. So, you know, our model is doing pretty well. We can probably go into uh, another 
iteration of bringing more training images, some variety you know, options here, and then do training once again when we have those. It's all great, so we can build our starting point, we have our custom model, but how do we actually use it? And with developers in the room, you're obviously more interested in how can I start um, using it within my applications. So you have an option of um, using, say at some point we're happy with our model, we've tested it all great, so we say okay, make it a default iteration, so whenever we use it from outside world, we will use the URL and that would be this particular iteration. And uh, when we click on prediction URL, you'll see that you offered with a URL of the service and a prediction key, which you can just use. And then you can either upload a URL of the image or the, 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 you know, the image itself. And very quickly, just to show you how you could use it from your application, but this is basically a REST API, so I don't need to teach you how to call a REST API. But you can, so I'm switching to the Azure Notebooks, which is just a service to run Python notebooks. Um, and say I have a, you know, I've taken an image and I actually need to classify it with my daughter's favorite pony or not. And um, so what I'm doing here is basically, I'm providing this URL, I'm providing that key which was in the service, I'm providing the, the URL of the image, and all I'm doing is just calling it and Oh, wonderful, not found because obviously I've changed that. Let's just, let's just use it very quickly here. So this one, and I think the URL is incorrect as well. Right, the key is correct, and the URL, which is the, oh, come on. Right, so this is the main one. This is basically an ID of the service, which I think where it failed. Okay. Right, let's do it very quickly here. Yeah, that's a different ID. Yeah. So fingers crossed. Yeah, so we got the response. And you can see it gives us various probabilities of the response. Unfortunately, probably our Applejack is actually not the, the train very well, but you can see that actually give me each of the probabilities, and if I, my model performs well, then I can actually pick up the top, the highest scoring probability, and just be, you know, use that response. So this is how you can um, build the service. Let me just switch back to the demo, to the deck. So this is how you can build those services. And then I uh, use the custom and um, custom model, sorry, the compact model of the service and actually took it out as a file. I brought it to the edge, which was my iOS emulated application. And then essentially all you do, you don't actually need internet, you don't need to have access to those services. It's all done within your, within your mobile application. You know, you take a photo, you do a uh, scoring of that, uh, whatever photo you've taken. And you can see sometimes it mis mispredicts, sometimes it's correct. So. This kind of things you could do, and if you're interested in code, how to do it, I'm more than happy to share it later on GitHub. So this is all good. We can literally in 10 minutes, we can build a small classifier based on our custom images and be done with that. All great, so that the task solved. But obviously we wanna, you know, as a developers, as data people, we wanna know how it actually works under the hood, right? How this kind of services work. So. Here, what I want to start is images, again, back to the data, right? So what is an image? Before we do anything um, on the deep learning side of things, we need to understand that any image we take is actually three channels. It has RGB, well, grayscale as well would be one channel. So it has color channels, it has particular width and height, and this is very important for the learning uh, using deep learning networks. Before we had neural networks, before deep learning actually was you know, as advanced as it is now, we oftentimes, in the data science, you'd start with feature engineering. And feature engineering, um, I'll, I'll explain an example. So for instance, if we were tasked a few years ago, if we were tasked, you know, we have uh, thousands of images of the clock face, you know, can you tell me what time it is, right, as a machine? And in this scenario, you would go to, I don't know, maybe understanding the 
histograms of the colors, maybe understanding you know, where the pixels are on the screen, where would be the you know, hand and um, hour hand and the minute hand. Actually, right now, you can just use those images and train your convolutional ne neural network. We'll see how to do it, but it's, it's doable with a bunch of images, but it will be kind of, you need a lot of samples and it will be quite a computationally uh, ineffective. So feature engineering back then, and it's still very valid in many projects, is that you start thinking from a domain perspective, I understand the domain. So if I actually do not bother with all this pixel, you know, highs and, you know, what's, where is each of the pixel, I just care about maybe a couple of pixels where the tip of those, um, uh, of those hands and write a Python script which kind of identifies, okay, if the pixel at this particular level, then, you know, you just have a coordination, you know, I, I'll adjust between it's here, that means it's actually you know, five minutes past or something like this. And then you have a bit of logic there. But then it's, maybe you can train machine learning on the top of that, but it's kind of one step extra. Maybe you can just do um, a change of coordinates instead of going you know, x, y like this, you actually change to polar coordinates. And then you have angles. All you're interested in is actually angles. And then you know that if it's you know, 15 minutes, it's actually 90 degrees. If it's, you know, 45 uh, degrees, that means it's, you know, one and a half hours, for instance, you know, half past one. So you just change the coordinates, and you don't even need to have machine learning anymore because it's all actually just a dictionary lookup and kind of just angles, right? So this is what feature engineering essentially is. You're understanding the domain. You're understanding what is important within that domain and how you could... Um, you know, how you could use it, use that knowledge. And this is where classic machine learning, and if you are, you know, working in this area or, you know, you're looking at and you're learning, this is where feature extraction, feature engineering is very important because machine learning in a classic, in the top, hand, uh, in the top level, um, you would need to um, kind of represent your data to, to a point where then you can feed it into machine and then it can learn because it doesn't have enough capacity to, to learn all, all those things. So feature extraction is a big part and that's why data cleansing and data transformation is a massive, massive uh, time investment when you do data science using classic machine learning. And our example would be, yes, so we have a car, as a car image of the car and then feature extraction, so we might be seeing that there is a you know, if we have how many um, loops of the, you know, for the wheels, it may be the mirrors, it may be some kind of shapes we'll, we'll find out somehow, and then we can extract those as a, as a pixels, and then we'll um, provide it to the algorithm, which will then do a classification and, and have an output, whether it's car or not. The difference uh, in um, deep learning is, uh, with deep learning, rather, is that those networks, they do this feature extraction and classification all together automatically. And it's, um, it's a big advantage, naturally. It requires a lot of compute resources because of that automation happening and you actually don't need to do a lot of things beforehand. But um, you, you, know, you can leverage the fact that you don't, maybe you don't need to have that strong domain knowledge. Um, However, having the good data set is extremely important because your, your networks will learn from those uh, features, from what is it in your, in your images. And um, similarly, you would need to have a lot of compute resources, mi much more than maybe for the shallow machine learning uh, algorithms. And um, so how do the deep learning actually learn? So the important thing uh, here is uh, representations. And um, if you look at this picture, which I took a couple of days ago, so, um, you know, we as humans, we look at that when you kind of, we can describe it very easily. You know, there's a shape, it's, there's a city, a uh, landscape, at background, at the background. And we kind of, we look at this and we have that um, understanding fairly quickly and uh, we don't break into points before we can understand what's there. And we can easily identify whether it's shape or plane or whatever it might be, right? With deep learning, what happens is this, the images are being used to start understanding the low-level features, and those, those might be the kind of edges, there might be some textures, uh, and so on. And then from there, learning, uh, the networks will start 
picking up the mid-level features, so they might understand the funnel, the bow, the stern, and so on. And then it will be actually coming back all together as a high-level abstract concept. Well, it's a ship, it's a plane, it's a, a high-rise tower, and so on. And uh, so those kind of mid, uh, sorry, low-level, mid-level, and high-level uh, features, so those are representations. And they're extremely important uh, for the neural networks. And we'll again, we'll sort of come back to those uh, concepts when we, when we look at the examples. So what is a neuron for any neural network? So sorry, a bit of a scribble here. My, my handwriting probably not great. Essentially, a neuron, which is, you'll have millions of them within the neural network, it's, it, has a, it has an input. So x1, 2, and however many uh, come into the summator. And each of the inputs has a weight associated with that. Uh, you have also bias coming into the, uh, into the neuron. And each of the neuron at the output will have uh, its activation function, which is extremely important. And we'll talk about various types of activation functions in a moment. So, with, with that, it's basically, so that's what it is, right? So the linear part is, you know, summing up the, the sum of the inputs with the weights and bias, and the nonlinear part would be your activation. So the layers of neural network is essentially, you know, you have a bunch of those neurons, and there would be millions of them as well. You have input layer, hidden layer, or layers, and output layer. So shallow one usually have just one hidden layer, and deep, and this is what the deep is in the neural network, is actually that it doesn't, there's a stack of those layers there. And there could be hundreds of them as well in some of the real world scenarios. But this is what, what are the, those are the layers. Uh, activation functions uh, as well, very important. So those bring, so these functions, they bring the non-linearity non into the, in all the calculations within the neural networks. And um, we don't go too much into math here, but the, the, the important things to remember about activation functions, so they have to be continuous and infinite in the domain. They're monotonous, so you can take the derivatives and so on with that. And they are nonlinear. And there's a few examples, I don't know if you can see it actually at the back, so the different layers may have a different types of function which are used. Normally, there are lots of options, lots of functions you could potentially use, but these ones are the kind of the, the de facto standard right now in the industry. So in the hidden layer, you either have a sigmoid where you have um, the value actually coming back from negative infinity to you know, positive infinity, and the values would be between zero and one. Uh, uh, tang would be the same one, but you actually have values from negative, you know, going between minus one and one. And the uh, rectified linear unit will only pick up the positive outputs. So anything negative will be actually, you know, just discarded as zero. And again, just think about that picture of the activation function. So this is what happens. So whenever we have that sum happening within the summator, you know, what is the value? Can we pass it on or not? And what would be the value we will pass it on, right? So this is how it works. And uh, in the output layer, so this is when this our final layer where before we say, is it a car or not? Is it a, this particular pony or not? Is it the value we're looking for? Uh, there are three types of, well, three types, two types actually of functions. So one would be you will not have any activation function because you actually might be looking for a number and that's why you just leave the row number as it is. And that would be your regression type of uh, models. And then you may have sigmoid function again when you have unrelated probabilities and you will use oftentimes softmax function, um, which I couldn't quite visualize, it's more of a mathematical uh, formula there, but which allows you to answer the question which of the, which of the classes is the probability really. So this is what we will be using within our um, examples later on. So is it good so far? All good? Yeah, a bit of a theory. I mean, it's kind of, you, you, we have to go through those things. So when we're going to do the demos in a bit, I'll be using Keras. So how many of you are familiar with, with Keras? Some of you, that's great. Um, so for those of you who don't know and who might have heard about TensorFlow, CNTK, Tiano, you know, lots of uh, deep learning frameworks right now. So this uh, library, so this is, um, uh, 
bunch of APIs written in Python, which is kind of a higher level, abstract level, and runs either TensorFlow or Microsoft CNTK or Tiano behind the scenes. So it kind of allows you to, peop allows people who are not maybe as you know, fluent in, say, TensorFlow to actually go and write those models. And you kind of, you will see that's a little bit easier to visualize it, to understand what's happening. And to be honest, it's, it's the same, like in software engineering, you know, we, you could have written your own data access layer and do all sorts of things, but then you can use those frameworks which will allow you to do what you need to do and move on, right? So do all the important things, it's all wrapped up. So, so this is what we'll be using, and I'll definitely recommend, if you're gonna be looking in this field, I mean, this is one of the things you should definitely look at because it makes life much, much easier for, um, for development. So if you look at the traditional neural network architectures available right now and being used in, in, in real life, so there are three types of architectures we see. So one of them is um, densely connected neural networks. So this is where we have all the neurons in all the layers, sorry, all the neurons in previous and uh, successful layer connected between each other. So this is something we saw just now uh, in the previous, one of the previous slides. The convolutional neural network is something we'll be talking about for the rest uh, of the session. Uh, and they are leveraging the fact that the inputs, in our case images, will have some sort of spatial relationship, they'll have some patterns in the images, and so on. And uh, another type of network architecture is uh, recurrent net neural networks, and this is more for the scenarios where you do some sort of time series analysis, when you do forecasting, you, you know, language is one of the examples as well, because it's kind of, there's a, there's a structure, there's a sequence to the you know, how we speak in language, and similarly with the speech recognition. So this is where those are used. So densely connected networks, seen this picture already. So there are four layers in this case. So we have input. Um, yeah, so actually, yeah. So we have input, there's two hidden layers, and the last one is an output layer. Um, so we see that all the neurons in the N minus one and N layer are connected and um, through the, those activation functions. And um, important things to remember that for each of those calculations, and again, think of that neuron, what it does so from the mathemat ma mathematical point of view, you do a lot of calculations there. So you'll have a lot of parameters. So you'll have a lot of inputs, weights, and bias coming in. And um, this is very important as we see the layers are going sort of deeper and wider, you know, you'll see that the number of parameters will be huge. And just if you'll see later on in, uh, in literature or you, you, you know, blogs or podcasts, so the capacity of the model is basically those number of parameters which can be learned by the models to be used for, for their recognition. So let me just demonstrate to you very quickly an example of how many parameters can be in a very simple uh, neural network. Uh, So I'll be using service called um, Azure Databricks. How many of you are familiar with that? I've heard of that, okay. Some Microsoft people, I think, are familiar. <laughs> right, so this is, um, this is a service which, among many things, it allows you to do sort of big data, ETL, and data engineering, which we kind of put aside for the moment, but also you can do machine learning with that. And this is what we'll be using. Um, and one of the uh, ways of how you can provision, so this is basically your big data clusters on the cloud as a platform as a service solution. So I don't need to have my servers running all the time. I can actually create GPU clusters on the cloud and you know, pay just for the use of that. So I can see so there's mine, so much compute. I have quite a bit of power associated with it. I'll just show you very quickly. So I have, two machines with two GPUs each, and you can see how much uh, memory I have. So you can even scale it more if needed, but I think that will be enough for the moment. So if we go into my first demo, so basically uh, Databricks UI is no notebooks. So if, you, if you're familiar with notebooks, you have no problem. So it's, everything is done within notebooks, and you can write in Python, Scala, SQL, whatever it might be for, for a particular task you're doing. So we'll be using Python here. So back to the problem. So not problem, but kind of demo um, I want to show here is we have images which are 
size of 224 to 24, 224 pixels. Guys, can you see it at the back actually? Is that okay? Yeah. So um, we have three channels, you know, the RGB channels. So we have input size, obviously the input shape and the number of classes we are doing here. So we actually, some of these variables we probably don't need for the moment. Um, this is the example of how you build your densely connected, you know, fully connected neural network using Keras. So what you do here is you do import Keras, this is a library, and we say, well, we're gonna build a sequential model. And of all the types of layers you support, at this particular point, we're just gonna use the dense layer. So again, the ones which are all interconnected. And we start building this model and say, well, this is my model, and can you please uh, do three layers? And so the first layer will have, um, will take an input, our image, 200 pixels, 200 pixels, and we'll have an output of 128, um, uh, output space of 128. And then it will be next layer, and the next layer, and then at the last bit, we'll have uh, our classifier, which will map those, uh, the previous layer into the number of classes we have, which is three. So this is how you define your model. And this is just a kind of just prescription, you know, prescriptive. This is how my architecture of my model will, will be. And if you use uh, a method called summary, uh, it will tell you, well, this is what you've defined and this is how it actually, what, what, it, what does it mean? So we have a dense layer one, which has an input, the original input, and it will have an output space of 128. And the number of parameters which are trainable there is, you can see, is, uh, what is it, 19 million parameters. And the reason for that is, um, I kind of put this a little note here so that you can see. So we have one, 224 into 224, the width and height. We have three channels, so that's three times more for input values. And then we have 128 neurons on that first layer. And then we have 128 uh, parameters for the bias. So this is how we have this 19 million. The next layer will be slightly smaller, so we reduce that dim dimensionality. We have 128 inputs into 64 neurons in this layer, and then 64 bias. Uh, so we have 8,000 parameters, and then we have 2,099, and all together, we will have only three outputs, whether it's class one, class two, class three. So this is how you can kind of start visualizing in your head how, how it works. So this is just to give you an idea of how many parameters you need. So, and you'd imagine if you have a much bigger layers and you would need much more computational power to do all sorts of calculations you need to do there. Right, so now back to my slide. Okay, so densely connected networks. Uh, one of the examples I wanna show you, so we'll get back to Databricks at the moment, and it, that's a kind of a hello world of image classification. So you, if, you, if you start working in this space, you will come across it very, very quickly. There's no way out of it. Um, MNIS database, so it's basically a handwritten digits from zero to nine, and there's like 60,000 training, and I think 10,000 testing images, and that has been done in US for the kind of image classification tasks at the, I think, US post or something like that. Um, so how do we do uh, this kind of training and how do we actually build the models which can, uh, oh, come on, this mouse is not great. Right, so we'll go here. So you'll see we will have a very similar things happening. So we will um, do the imports. Um, Keras, again, being this high-level library, high-level framework, it has a number of data sets already you know, available to you to use for training and for, for learning. So MNIST is one of those. And um, so we can start loading data directly from MNIST, and that will go and pick it up. Um, from the, wherever it's stored, so done. And then, so what we're now providing is, um, 
So we say, okay, we're gonna be using, so our classifier will use 10 classes to predict from zero to nine. So we have um, in input images, so they are in a grayscale channel, so it's only one channel, and it's 28 to 28 pixel, so it's quite small ones. And um, so 60,000 of training images, and um, any machine learning doesn't work with images, right? So you need to modify it into array or floats and kind of you know, feed the numbers into the machine learning algorithms. Otherwise, it will not work. Same with if you do some text, you do encoding, you know, again, you do some kind of workaround to, to get the arrays of, of values. And this is what we're doing here. So we're doing reshape, we're changing the type, and then we scale it instead of being zero to, to, to 200, uh, 55 um, luminosity of that RGB channel, right? Uh, you would do it from between zero and one, so that's why we do division by two, 255. And same for the test data. And test data will be used later on for validation that our model is actually performing well. Um, so here, if we run this um, cell, so what we do here, so we get our test and train data ready as well as labels for the you know for the test and for the for the training and as as i said we have 60,000 train example 10,000 test examples and now we are going to build this fully connected neural network and um, similarly as i've shown before so i don't need to go into detail how parameters are calculated but basically yeah so we have a first dense layer uh, which will have an output of 512 um, so output space will be 512. Uh, and the activation function, as I mentioned before, so there will be this um, rectified uh, logic unit function, so the one which is kind of just cut off uh, the negative numbers. And then the last, the second and the last layer would be our 10 class output uh, classification using softmax because we are trying to see which of the probabilities of among the, these 10 classes we have. So. Um, so this is the summary of that model. And this, yeah, so details again how it's calculated. So you can see the number of parameters are half a million pretty much. Um, and now, how do we actually train that model? So okay, we build it, we've, we've defined it, but how do we build it? So we need to uh, specify a few metrics for the model so that when the training happens, when we have a propagation of the weights going back and forward, forward and back, sorry, we need to um, say, well, what we're interested in when the training happens is the accuracy of the model, and so how, how, you know, how closely those images are classified, how correctly they're classified. We'll have the optimizer, uh, and this is, you know, how will network update itself when it's training, during the training process, and um, the, the, the loss function will be calculated based on the categorical cross entropy, and that means that we have a classification problem where they have multiple classes. There might be a binary cross entropy and um, some other examples of the of the loss function. The most important part is here. So what we do here is we actually fit our model or train our model using our training data and uh, providing our training labels. Uh, and labels in the sense, obviously, you know, if this is the image five, then this is the answer should be five and so on. We have um, 128 images being used by the network during the training, you know, those mini batches, 120 each, each time. And then we will run five times over the, of this training data set, trying to learn more about those features, those low level, mid level, and high level features. And then we will validate our model on the test and train data set. So I will kind of skip this bit. So this would be probably wouldn't take much time, but I'm just worried about the Wi-Fi. So this is how it goes. So it starts with some random weights. You know, again, think of those neuron models. So you have weights and bias. There's some random weights associated, and then the accuracy is really low, and then it picks up, it, it uh, calculates the loss functions, and then updates the weights, and so on and so on. We actually get, after few runs, epochs, uh, which is the terms in the deep learning, we actually quite can get to quite a high level of um, accuracy. So you see we have the, if we do the test, if we evaluate our model using our test data set and labels, you will see that our test loss is very small and our accuracy is 97.7%. So this is how the, you know, 
how you can write this kind of models within Keras. Can we actually visualize this? Um, so there's a nice, oh, yeah, so there's a nice visualization of this um, of data set written by somebody really nice. There's a link there. I can't remember the name, unfortunately. Uh, so you can literally draw the number, and then you'll get the, what was it, the first guess and second guess. And this would be your neural network, the first layer. You remember those so many neurons in the first layer, and then there's so many neurons in the second layer, and the classifier at the, at the end of it. So this is a kind of visualization. What I found interesting, because this is obviously using the American style of writing. So in Russia, for instance, so we write seven like this. And that's screwed up, because let's say the first guess is number three. And you can now see how it actually learns, right? So it picks up that seven will actually have feature of you know, maybe two strokes, or there's nothing in between in the middle. It doesn't have any loops. Whereas in my case, it has something right in the middle. So maybe it looks like three, closer to three. Though the seven is still second guess, so it's still close. I found it quite amusing. Right, so now we get into the convolutional neural networks. So the idea around CNNs, or convnets, there are different ways how people are calling them. The idea is it's kind of biological inspiration. You know, the visual cortex in animals and humans uh, deals very well with a sort of local spatial, oops, sorry, local um, regions of what, what we see. And so this is a similar idea for the convolution layers, which we'll see in a moment. So important for, for this kind of networks uh, is structure to input data, it's those patterns, it's those spatial relationships. So that's why they're very good for the computer vision tasks compared to, for instance, sequential tasks, which would be for the recurrent uh, neural networks. So the typical architecture for the CNNs will have, again, now you kind of can understand whether those different layers, what are those. So you'll have um, an input, and in this case, again, we use the five uh, as an input, that image. You have a number of convolution layers, and um, you'll have a number of layers which are called pooling layers, and they will be doing different things. And then again, you'll have a stacks of those, stacks of those, and then at the end, you'll have this FC is a fully connected or densely connected layer, which will then provide us with an output. And um, what I want to show you is actually how it's, sorry, just give me a second. I'm struggling here with my presentation a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Um, so what I want to now look through the parts of the layers and explain what are those, those what, what do they mean, what they do, and how we can actually stack them together in, in our demo. So convolutional layer is very important for the convolutional neural networks. The reason is it allows us to extract features from the image, those low-level, high-level features, mid-level features I spoke about. The idea is essentially you might have a, you can visualize it with a, flat, you know, with a torch or flashlight, and you go along the image, and you try to you know, highlight the sub-regions of that image, and you provide um, various calculations around that. So if you can see on the left-hand side, you have a, our image, and we have a filter which actually just looks at, at the corner. So you can see zeros and ones in that yellow side, uh, in the yellow part, and that will actually just do, will do matrix calculations element by element, and if, it, if something is there is zero, it will ignore it. If it's one, then it will actually sum it up. So that's why we have a convolved feature four. Similarly, we could just carry it on with those filters, and those filters are usually quite small. They are the three by three or five by five. And um, you'll start understanding, you'll start creating this feature map uh, after the, uh, towards the end of your, uh, that layer. You'll have a feature map, and that will be reducing your dimensionality of the image, and you will kind of extract some of the important features from, from that, uh, from that uh, input image. You may have multiple filters, so some of them might be detecting ages, some of them might be detecting, I don't know, loops. Let's say if you think of zeros and eights, you know, you have two loops there, and then you kind of start see looking if you have anything like that. So that would be our first uh, run through. So you will have, if you have 10 filters, like in that little image, you probably don't see it on the top, but from five, you'll get to the convolution layer, which will, you'll have uh, 10 of those feature maps. And those feature maps uh, will be then um, 
going into the next layer, which is a pooling layer. But one thing to note before that, so while we're doing this uh, matrix calculation, this is a linear operation, but we want to bring the non-linearity there. So you would usually have that calculation of the feature map and the output would be running through the uh, rectified linear unit. So you will have that uh, non-linearity you know, br brought into the network too. And so the next layer, the second part, pooling layer, will take our rectified feature map, run through the convolution layer and through the ReLU function, and it will then uh, use either max or average or summation functions to actually you know, still look at our picture, but actually reduce the dimensionality. Because going from you know, 20, 20 million of parameters, we want to go down and further down and further down down to the three, five, ten classes at the end, right? So we still, we want to reduce that dimensionality, but we still want to retain what is the most important in this image. And this is what, how it happens. And similarly, we have small filters, usually two by two, which goes not sliding across the image, but actually goes in steps and strides, you know, and just kind of, again, highlighting, but very specific areas in that image. So you can see we're going from four by four down to two by two matrix here. So this is what happens in the pooling layer. And again, you will have, if you have 10 filters at the start, you will have 10 filters in the pooling layer again. You'll have 10 feature maps there. And effectively what happens here, the process is that understanding of those features, the distillation of the information. You know, we might start with millions of pictures of bicycles, but once we distill it further, once we distill it further, we actually end up something like the sketch where, you know, the most important bits are here so we can recognize it's a bicycle, even if it doesn't have all the fancy bells and whistles, right? So this is how it actually, the, intuitively, this is how it works. The next part is um, fully connected layer. So it's kind of the, the last bit at the end. The idea is uh, that we have, towards the end of the network, we have all of those high-level features. And, um, you know, if it's a bicycle, there are two, you know, two uh, wheels, there's a saddle, some, something like this. If it's a boat, there are some other features. So we have those features abstracted. But now we need to kind of um, take them and bring those into classification. And the cl classes in this case would be based on the training data set. And so for, for this simple example a video or image is, you know, whatever we had in the previous layer, so we actually want to classify it down to the four classes. And the important thing here is if your training data set, for instance, didn't have, I don't know, submarine, so it, even if you provide a submarine as an image, it will always actually classify it as one of those four classes because that's what it's trained on, right? So you need to make, be aware of, of that. There's no magic read, unfortunately, there. It's all math and it's all, um, you know, all that process there. So, um, now, with any um, machine learning and specifically deep learning, uh, overfitting is a massive problem. And overfitting is essentially um, memorization, memorization of the data set. Because you can provide all your data and you know, run as many times as you want your um, networks against it, and it will, can just memorize it brilliantly. And that's great because we'll get, as you've seen in my custom vision before, 95, 98% accuracy, everything is amazing. But actually, when you try to generalize it or bring the test data it hasn't seen before, it failed spectacularly, right? So this is where there is always an issue of how you kind of bring the performance of the model as, as best as you can based on the training data set, but still generalize well enough. And um, there are a few techniques uh, used within deep learning. Um, and they are very important, especially when we have small data sets. Again, coming back to the pony example, you know, I have probably hundreds of samples of each of the class. I don't have 10,000 of them, so I don't have all sorts of variations. So I only have that much, and my, my network can learn all of them, but then will still fail. So the techniques you could use, uh, one of them is called data augmentation. And the idea is kind of while we do training of the neural network, we want to bring more and more samples, even if we have a small data set, we want to maybe stretch the those images, we want to squash them, we want to rotate them, we want to, you know, reverse them, kind of squeezing out whatever we have from our data set for the network to train from, right? So it can actually learn different ways of how the image can be. And you can see here, there's a random transformation available. So number six, for instance, here, you know, you can see all sorts of things done. And then it again, 
when the, during the training, it will just go into the, this would be our ve number of input images. Instead of one, you'll have you know, 20 of the same, but actually with a bit of difference. And then it will be used for the training. Um, next one is a dropout. And again, similar idea that we don't want to you know, learn too well, memorize our data set. So we want to learn from less to learn better, to again to, to do that. And the idea is, the example is you might have a standard, you know, densely connected neural network, but then we start kind of disconnecting some of the neurons, we kind of switching them off. So activation function will basically be zero on those. And then what happens here, neural network will start learning the most important features out of that of that image. So at each of the layers, it will actually pick up the right things rather than everything, including the noise and kind of a memory of the, you know, of, of that only data that we have. So from there, what I want to do, do now, we have a bit of time. So um, just want to show you the demo of how you can start building that pony classifier from scratch. So again, now you have a bit of a kind of mental model of what the CNNs are and how they, you know, what would be there. So we have an input with six classes. We have images of 150 pixels into 150 pixels. It's totally arbitrary number, but you know, that works for now. And then output would be number of these six classes we have. So. Right, so we have all of that. So I have, uh, my, my images are sitting within Azure Blob Storage. So you can see I have, I've mounted it into Databricks, so you can just use it as a folders. Um, so now you see that we are building our classifier, our neural network is pretty much the same blocks as we've seen before, but we have now extra types of layers. So we bring the convolutional layer and that will use the three by three filters with activation function ReLU, and our input shape is 150 by 150. And then we will do pooling on those layers for each of those um, you know, stacks of filters. We'll do the pooling, so we'll kind of reduce the dimensionality. Then we do another, we'll bring another filter, same three by three, and then reduce, and another filter. And so this kind of goes as a kind of you know, stacks of, of those, um, of those layers. Um, just to tell you, there is no specific science of how you actually build those neural networks. It's a little bit of art rather than science at this point in time in the industry because it's kind of you need to build, you start with a simple architecture and then maybe you start including you know, um, you know, your output, how many neurons you want to have in your network. You start playing with that, you start bringing more, understanding what's the accuracy, what's the loss, and similarly how many layers you want to have in the network, fewer or more, and so on. So there's a little bit of the process around there. So hopefully in a few years' time, when it's a bit more established, there would be kind of, I don't know, patterns and ideas of what's the best, but at the moment, it's like that. So what we have here is so a number of convolution pooling layers, and then we flatten those, and we have the densely connected layers, as we've seen before, and we actually have six classes there. So this is the summary of a model. And as I've said before, we, we will compile our model with categorical cross-entropy because we have multiple classes and accuracy is one of the metrics we're looking at. Uh, data pre-processing, as I already, I think I probably will kind of skim through. Again, we'll take our data, we will you know, scale it from zero to 255 to zero and one intervals. Um, we will um, convert those floating point multidimensional arrays. And here what um, we're also doing at a little bit, we're doing some augmentation. So we do reshaping, we're doing some zooming and shearing. So we start bringing, because we don't really have a lot of data, so let's just bring a little bit of that. So we do that and um, we'll have, so you see we have 400 images, we have 100 images in the training class, uh, sorry, 400 images in training and 100 images in testing. and. Um, we will be do, we'll start, uh, sorry, hold on, I'm just trying to find, yeah. So we'll start fitting our generator, and we're gonna go through 10 epochs, so 10 runs across our images, taking 30 images at a time, and then we'll have training images, you know, again, with the steps of 10. So I'll just keep an eye on time, so I'll probably 
skip that running bit as well, because it takes quite some time, so five minutes at least. And then we can save that model, actually, within the service. We can save it, uh, but Keras provides it, so you can actually, re so this is expensive part. Training is expensive part. You might take you know, minutes and hours to do that. So you want to save it, and then you want to actually um, build, uh, sorry, start using your images to score it. So we can kind of see where, you know, if our network is doing well or not. So there's a kind of few, few ways how you can uh, go about it. So I'll just skim through this one. So what I'm going to do is just kind of uh, just to use our custom CNN to score the, some of the test images. And you've seen the images we had already in the custom vision model. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, so I'm going to load this model. I'm going to provide the URL of the image. And what I'm going to do is press provide what's the prediction class and what's the probability of that class to be. And here I'm basically running through my um, array of, oh, sorry, the, the, the folder, the test folder, and processing it one by one. So if you remember, maybe not, but there's a first Apple Jack in the custom vision model failed. It said, well, it was, I think it was also Fluttershy because of there's a lot of pink background. So in that case, it's again, our custom model identified that it was the same class with a yeah, high enough probability 0 0.3. So we probably really need to train our models with that. The second image, for instance, was identified as Apple Jack with a score of 0 0.99. So it's fairly confident it's the one. And you can see here, it kind of, um, uh, for each of the images, so I, I put the name so I could recognize them too. So I have prediction classes actually defined correctly, but the probabilities are fairly low. So you know, 0 0.003. Here it's actually some number with you know five, six uh, images, uh, digits there. So, but the class is actually kind of correct. So rainbow dash, twilight sparkle. So all of it, it works, but it still needs a bit more augmentation. You know, maybe more data is there and so on. So this is. Um, how you can build one, and this is completely from scratch using Keras and using our own custom data set, right? So now we have just about five minutes. So what I want to do uh, here is just talk about transfer learning, which you may have heard, have heard already. Um, it's a, an approach where you actually want to reuse somebody's, you know, leverage somebody's investment into building those models. You know, somebody already went through the pain of building network architectures with 150, la 150 layers in it, right? And actually validated it and fine-tuned it and all of that. And you don't want to go and start today building that. So there are quite a few of those available already based on research, based on some of the competition in the industry. And you can start leveraging those for your training for build, bringing your own, um, bringing your own custom classifiers, for instance, you know, as a ba using it as a basis. So you have some random neural network, say, for instance, Microsoft Research provided one. You know, it's trained on the ImageNet, which is uh, massive data sets, millions of images, 20,000 class, uh, 20, yeah, so classes. So you know, amazing work has been done, a lot of investment. Can we actually take it and bring it together with our data and get some other results? And um, what I wanted to show you, but I'm just conscious we don't have much time. So I'll, again, I'll put it on GitHub, so the demo how you could actually just use that pre-trained model. So this is my, my own picture from Tower of London. And you know, I bring it, can you actually just classify it, tell me what it is. So it, it looked at that image and said, well, it's a suspension bridge with a you know, probability 97%. Well, that's pretty good. That was pretty impressive. And, but how can I actually leverage for my own classification models, right? Well, this is something it's already know about. So this is nothing particularly impressive, but how can I take it for my own knowledge? So the idea is that you can start using, from the left-hand side, you have your, say, image nets, or say, Microsoft Research example. You know, they build this neural network. They have a convolution base, and they have their own trained classifier, you know, suspension bridges, I don't know, uh, various vehicles, whatever it might be. What we do now, the next step, we can say, well, you know what, I actually don't care about that classifier. Please give me, give me all of whatever you've done there, and I'll just remove that. I'll replace that bit of the classifier with my own, with my ponies, for instance, or something else. And you can put that layer on the top of that base, making sure that the rest of that base is frozen. So you don't actually mess around with that, but you only train your model on the, on the bits of that. And if you can see here, the uh, code snippet is, you take the convolutional base, so here, so with one of the predefined architectures, you have some weights associated with that, 
and you say, well, do not include the top. I don't care about the classifier. Don't, do not include it. Everything else is as usual. And then when you build your model, as we've seen it before, you say, well, start with the convolutional base, and then add the layers with my classifier there. And the only thing is here, you need to make sure that it's not trainable, that, that the, the original base is not trainable, so we don't mess up with the weights there. And that allows you to actually bring those, just those new classifier on the top of it. If you want to go any further, if you, for instance, feel that, you know, still model is not doing too well, I want to, you know, fiddle a little bit here, do some fine tuning, you can start, so this, this bit is kind of we've done, and it's kind of okay, but could be better. Then we can start going, you know, further one level, one level down in the stack, and start maybe fine-tuning this base. But that part you don't want to be dealing with, because again, think about those representation I've told you at the start. So when the image comes in, the neural network learns about low-level features, then mid-level features, and this part, the four and five, will probably have some of high-level features. So high-level features you may want to sort of tune a little bit, but you don't want to be dealing with edges and textures and all the sort of things which has been done there. So this is a, an interesting approach too. So a few takeaways. If you're interested just in APIs and how to use it, you have a simple problem to solve, start with custom vision. You know, you literally need just data and maybe five, 10 minutes to actually train it and, and test it. If you want to build your own, you know, have a good data set, use Keras definitely to implement those CNNs. And if you need GPUs, you know, you can <clears throat> obviously invest in your own hardware, you can provision them on the cloud through the virtual machines, or you can use Databricks as a starting point um, on Azure as a, you know, to have that playground. And uh, with the CNNs, you know, you may start with a naive approach, or you can start using pre-trained models and actually leverage that, and apply those techniques of data augmentation and the dropout layers. The resources I would definitely, definitely recommend, uh, there are two books. So one is called Groking Deep Learning by Andrew Trusk, and that uh, goes into a lot of information, no, not mathematical, but actually a lot of conceptual information, what are the deep learning and how to build those. And if you want to learn Keras, so this is a book by the person who wrote Keras, so Francois Chalet, so amazing book, please look at that. Some of the examples I used actually from there, so I would definitely recommend that. So what's next for me with that? Obviously, there are more, more to classify, Pokemons, Paw Patrol, whatever you think of. Right, and with that, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great NDC Sydney.